in there. But for now, Michael, you want to go ahead and give us a speech number 10? All right. We'll travel, whether it's to the Arctic, the jungle, the Andes, or to some culture where that's completely different from your own, you can always learn something new. You can gain new perspectives to broaden your horizon. You can learn more about science, about culture, about history, about geology, about geography, about culture, about food, and about human ingenuity. You can gain exciting new experiences that can improve your perspective on your life at home. Now, I just want to take three particular uh, examples of how travel can benefit your life, and I want to draw from my recent trips to Churchill, Manitoba. Just this last month, I went to the Churchill Northern Study Center to take an, a learning vacation on northern ecology, like winter, winter north, northern ecology in the subarctic. And last year in February, I went to the same place for a workshop on northern lights. So that's what I'll be drawing from. Now, the first specific advantage of travel is a broader Right, broader horizons. I found that when you travel to a relatively obscure area or hard to reach area, things can be expensive. You walk into the grocery store in Churchill and you see things like a loaf of bread costing six or seven dollars. A case of 12 pop cans is like fifteen dollars and a pack of cigarettes is twenty-four dollars. Not that I recommend that, but that's what it is. And, and keep in mind that Churchill is accessible by train. If you go farther into the Arctic, where there's no train, things are a lot more expensive even than that. So it's kind of amazing how people get by. Okay, and I also learned about the, the plight of some of the indigenous Inuit people of the area. There are some, like First Nation tribes, some of them have been forcibly relocated to other locations, and we heard from a, an elder of the Dene tribe whose tribe had been relocated, and she told us a bunch of interesting things, like, well, they had to, besides the relocation, they then had to give up their traditional way of life. They had to give up their dog sledding and hunting, like going around to hunt for all their food. And they took on a Western diet. And of course, that kind of led to obesity. And they, a lot of them also took up alcoholism. And you can imagine all the social problems that that caused. So what I learned from all this is that be thankful for where you are in, in normal American life. You have it a lot better than a lot of people do. A second specific advantage of travel is you learn more about science and nature and inherent reality. Now Churchill is famous for polar bears. If you go up in October or November, you'll see hundreds of polar bears congregating around the city. Now, I did not see any. I was not there at the right time, but still, that's what it's known for. What they do is they wait around for the Hudson Bay to freeze over because they like to spend most of the year walking around on the sea ice hunting seals. So they, look, they walk around on the ice looking for holes where the seals come up to breathe and they pounce on the seal and get, grab it and eat it. And what's really cool is that the seal fat is converted very efficiently to fat on the polar bear. So like literally about 90% of the seal's fat is added to the polar bear's fat reserve. And that's important because during the summer months they have to walk around on land where there is relatively little for them to eat. Now they also mate on land and the female, the pregnant females, do not, do not go out on the ice. They find a little den somewhere and have their babies in the winter. And in early March, they take their babies, their little cubs out and try to find food. The problems facing the polar bears is, of course, related to climate change and global warming. There is a definite trend over the last couple decades, at least, that the sea ice has been covering the Hudson Bay for less and less time each year. Of course, that's a generalization. There are a few anomaly years. But this is a big problem for the polar bears because they have less time to stuff themselves on seals and more time to expand their fat reserves. This causes more and more bears to starve, and there's a real concern that within 40 years, the entire population of the, west, the polar bears in the West Hudson Bay will be extinct. Now, there will still be some farther north in the Arctic, but we're just talking about the, the population around Churchill here. We also learned about Northern Lights. It's pretty amazing when you, when you go out and see them. We learned that they, they come actually from electrical storms in the sun that emit, that emit charged particles out into space. Then they interact with particles in the Earth's upper atmosphere. Then they release photons, and we see that as the Northern Lights displays. It's really neat to stand out there watching them dance across the sky. 
It's also fun to figure out how to photograph them. It's, that requires some special tricks. They appear mostly white to the unaided eye, but in, in your photograph they normally appear green, which is kind of weird. But anyway, uh, we also learned about snow. Here in San Antonio, we don't think about that too much, but up there, where you live in several feet of snow all the time, you have a lot of different words for snow. For example, the snow that accumulates on tree branches is called Kali. And the bottom layer of snow that's a little more packed and crystalline because it's under all the other layers is called the Pukak layer. We learned about the, the temperature gradient of snow. Say it's negative 30 degrees outside, but once you start digging down into the snow, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, and the Pukak layer is actually just a few degrees below freezing. And it turns out that there are a lot of little critters that live down there, like there's a little uh, shrew with a mass of about a dime that makes its living tunneling around in the Pukak layer, and it's able to access the grass underneath it, and a few insects do the same type of thing. So it's really amazing. So the takeaway from all this is that travel can teach you a lot about science and, and maybe impact how you live at home regarding environmental issues. The third specific advantage of travel is it can give you amazing and exciting experiences. We had the interesting opportunity to learn how to build igloos and quinzies. To build an igloo, you go out into an open field where the snow is normally packed hard because of the wind, and you actually take this saw and you cut out bricks of snow. And you don't have to pack them more or anything, you just cut out the bricks, and you, you start laying them out in a circle, then you cut some more bricks out, and you have to whittle them away a little bit to get them to be the right shape and size and make another layer and then a third layer. Then you can kind of dig in a tunnel to, to get into it and build a little portal and put another brick type thing on top to close it all off. And there you have your igloo. And even though it's negative 30 or 40 degrees outside, it's nice and cozy, just a few degrees below freezing inside, which if you have a good sleeping bag, is just fine and comfortable. Now, a Quincy is a little bit different. <coughs> To build a Quincy, you have to go where the snow is more powdery and fluffy, not back down. That's normally the case in woodlands. So to build a Quincy, you build a huge pile of this fluffy snow, then let it set for three or four hours, and let it harden a little bit. Then you basically just dig in and excavate a little cave in there, then you can go in there and sleep. And it's almost as comfortable as an igloo. <coughs> Another experience we had was dog sledding. What struck me about that is just how excited the dogs were to do it. This outfit we used has a huge yard full of dogs. I don't know how many, probably at least 20 or 30. But they can only choose eight for any particular run. So when the musher goes in there to choose his dogs, they're basically all yelping at you, yip, 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 choose me, choose me, choose me. Mm -hmm. And during the run, they're all really excited about doing it. You can, you can tell that they're born and raised for exactly that kind of thing. So. I also got to drive a snowmobile, which is quite a thrill. I got to try snowshoes, that was a little different. But I think my favorite experience of all was riding in a cart pulled by a snowmobile across the frozen sea ice of the Hudson Bay. That was probably the bumpiest ride I've ever been on, and it was negative 40 degrees out with wind chill, and I broke my glasses in the process, but it was still quite a thrill. <laughs> and we got to walk out on the Hudson Bay then. We got, we got off the cart and started walking on the ice, and we could actually hear the ice pop and crackle and groan. And it turns out that that's because of the tides of the sea going in and out under the ice. So that was a little bit creepy, but it was, it was still a major hoot. The takeaway from all this is if you travel, you can get a lot of experiences that you cannot get with a Disney vacation. So I just want to close with a challenge. Start thinking about and planning a two-week vacation Go to somewhere where you can broaden your horizons, learn more about science and nature, and have amazing new experiences. I strongly recommend the Churchill Northern Study Center, but of course there are a lot of other possibilities as well. Thank you. That's great. We've heard so many interesting stories from you, and uh, I think if the 